This is Podcast Episode 51. But if you invest now, on Thursday, August 29th, 2019. And now, that's a new minimum. This episode of Podcast is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersad. This episode has show notes at thenexus.tv slash PK51. Hello, hello. Hello. How's it going? It's going well. Yeah, going well. We've got quite the pod kit lined up tonight. We sure do. I think we can we can start it a little bit differently this episode and maybe do a little bit of follow-up about what we said we were probably gonna do at the end of the previous episode. Like, is that a good a good way to start and catch people up? It's self-follow-up. Like nobody is following up with us, we're doing it ourselves. There you go. Sounds about right. Yeah. Uh, Let's see. So we had a couple events this week, uh, starting with serverless MN on Monday. So that's always a good time. We had a speaker uh, in town, Joe Carlson, who works for MongoDB. Uh, He walked us through their serverless platform and talked about how it kind of differs from some of the others. That's really good stuff. Joe's a cool speaker who's been around a lot of meetups and super cool too always to run into folks who are um uh getting into developer relations uh because it's not necessarily a huge number of the people like by headcount in in the state of minnesota um but we have a couple and it's growing and that's always super fun because i don't know developer relations is a is a cool industry and i like it and i want to see cool people doing it um from 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 around here so that's good stuff and Brian, you were over there, right? What'd you think? Yeah, it was good. Uh, so, you know, me at a serverless meetup, I follow along, but I, I don't have any personal experience. I do, you know, I do front end. So, uh, I mean, if you've written a function before, about. it's the same. It's just in the cloud. Yeah. See, I think it would be they'd be really fun to write. I just don't have any architecture built up for that in a super easy way. Though I probably could learn it really quick. Here, here, some of these cool sites are. Are nice. That's the beautiful part about it. You you type it now and it deploys itself. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Let's see. Then uh, two days later, we had JavaScript a man. Um, oh my we, gosh! That was just yesterday. Sure was. Uh, we had a uh, Shalana Dawson come and talk about building SVGs by hand. It was super cool. Um, I always like her talks. They're um, they're very engaging. Yeah, they're engaging. They're really well put together. And uh, this one was just all examples in CodePen. And it was super um, helpful to just describe and build up these SVG documents with the whole meetup group and explain how some of the features of SVGs work or how they work. Very cool. Yeah, it was awesome. It was a really good event. Um, Super cool to have Shalana back as a speaker. Hey, Ryan, I hear you got a new phone. Is that right? You're right. I got yet another new phone. It's not an iPhone, though. It is oh, a man. Galaxy Note 10 Plus from Samsung. That's a lot of notes. That's yeah, a lot of notes. it's a lot of notes. Um, you know, sometimes people say the writing's on the wall, but the writing's on the note. I wasn't going to uh-huh. get an iPhone. You were right. So have you had a couple days to mess around with it? What do you think? Yeah, you know, I've had it for about a week now. Uh, and, you know, it's it's really similar to all the other Samsung Galaxy phones that I've had. Uh, it is big. It has the little pen stylus thing, which is kind of fun. Um, you know, in a meeting, like, you could always, like, ping somebody when somebody's being silly on the phone. <laughs> you can just ping somebody like, hey, that person's being silly on the phone. And you can all kind of smirk at each other. Well, what, yeah. if, what if you're in person and you can't really like do that because somebody would notice? So what I can do is I can pass my phone around like paper note. Nice. <laughs> yeah, that's not more noticeable. <laughs> Certainly not. Yeah, we always used to back channel Slack notification Slack Slack messages on phone calls. Yeah. I developed some perhaps bad habits then. Yeah, but, you know, a little agency bit. Agency life. It's everybody's life. This is true. Brian, I heard that you uh, went to uh, uh, like a ton of places recently. So much travel. I finally, yeah, I'm finally home for the remainder of the year. I, you know, had a crazy summer of traveling all the time. I burned through two thirds of my PTO in two months and then had jury duty also. Ugh. So yeah, in the beginning of the month, I went to California to see my sister and then see some high school friends in San Francisco. It's super fun. Good to get out to the 
Bay Area again. It had been almost 10 years. So, and then last week I went to Salt Lake City in Utah. And we can lead that into our first topic, which is me discussing React Rally a bit. Did React Rally have any like intro music? Like, how do they introduce React Rally? Um, I ra- lost track of time, so I was not actually in the room when Michael Chan, the MC, started talking on stage. I walked in pretty shortly after, but I'm not sure how they fully started it. Now, there is a Spotify playlist out there if you search for React Rally 2019, and there's some really good uh, music in there they were playing throughout the breaks and kind of transition times and as people were walking onto the stage and things. So I would check that out. Cool. So there was music. That's an important part. There was music. Um, yeah, I think there were... Um, 500 attendees. So for our listeners so. who don't really know what React Rally is, what is it? Yeah. So yes, that's a good point. It is a two-day conference in Salt Lake City. Um, it's a community-organized conference for, I guess, React developers and anyone interested in that kind of ecosystem and community and framework and web development in general. So there's a single track, so one talk at a time. They're all about half an hour long. Uh, There's a break in the morning, break in the afternoon, and a two-hour break for lunch. So there's lots of time to talk and network and hear new ideas and things. Uh, I'm reading the uh, What is React Rally description here on the website, and my favorite part is isomorphic is crossed out. (laughs) (laughs) R.I.P. So I got a question for you, Brian. I know React Conf is coming up in a couple months, too, or next month, is it? October. 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 So how does React Rally and React Conf, like, how do they relate to one another? Is this kind of like a a, a pre... Well, maybe maybe I've answered my own question. Is it like a pre pre precursor, kind of? Not in the sense that some of the same talks will be shared, but just, like, as far as where it sits in kind of the broader React communities, like calendar of like important events yeah. like is is react rally more about the core team and this is more about the community or something like that yeah so this is community organized react Ra- uh react conf is put on by facebook ah, so gotcha. the the organization is a little different from what i've heard most people prefer react rally don't hold me to that but um that's kind of the impression i've gotten from talking to people I know at wow. one point Dan Abramov tweeted that React Rally is his favorite conference. Um, I I heard about React Rally on Twitter. I think it was um, Henry Zhu of Babel with the the photo of tips for Babel. That's where I first kind of heard about the conference while it was going on last summer. And then I had followed the Twitter account and just seen a few more people talking about it as it came up. Yeah, it was single track throughout the day, two days. Um, there's a list of speakers on their website. Um, I think all the talks were really good. There was no talk that stood out as being like much worse than than any other. Like, I think they were all very high quality, very entertaining, learned a ton from all of the talks on a wide range of topics. And then I got to talk and meet a lot of people who I'd followed on Twitter and looked up to and used code that they've written in my application at work or on my own time. So that was just really fun to just talk with people as well as others from around the country as they came to learn as well. And so, um, yeah, went out for lunch with several different people. Uh, in the evening, they had a karaoke. So I watched uh, many people singing karaoke. Um, Friday, the evening activity was walking over to a mall, having some food from food trucks, played some cornhole, and played some of the mind card game i've played a little bit before but really played quite a lot during their conference so that was a good way to meet many people yeah so i i uh i found the the web stream for react rally and that was pretty fun to watch uh, i actually watched it with matt for a little bit and uh by a little bit i mean we probably watched the whole first day's worth of video recording and we would just skip whenever you guys had a break. We would just skip to the next. We would just keep scrabbling and scrabbling until we found one. From your impression, did it seem like there were more breaks and talks? or? Uh, it felt like I had to keep skipping a lot, which isn't a bad thing because like, the whole point of the conference is to be like to make friends and to hang out with people and just chat. 
So it, it, it seems fine. Yeah, I, I thought the pacing was pretty good. I really appreciated a two-hour break for lunch. And the way they did that was they uh, a sponsor got a $40 Visa gift card for every person. So you would just be bre- you'd break at noon for lunch, and then you'd have two hours to mingle with whoever and go to any local place around. And so that's you weren't a- restricted to conference food. You could just try the local places. That's an amazing idea, and that probably works really well in Utah – and Salt Lake City, it would be really like. Could you imagine doing that in Midwest JS? Like, there's no place you can just go and walk to eat that's less than a thousand dollars in downtown Minneapolis. Like, that's impossible. I I think so. When I was on jury duty, I think food in downtown Minneapolis for lunch is cheaper than food in Eden Prairie for lunch. Sure, you just have to find it uh, and pretty survive. Easily. Ali's, Ali's Deli in the Skyways, man. That's that's the, that's the place to go. I mean, not everybody, but the folks the folks who are in the know will go to Ali's Deli, right? The food trucks and all that. But I, I feel you. I feel you. It's difficult because it's kind of a different kind of uh, urban area. Maybe Extreme, extremely strange urban area. Yeah, we've got Minneapolis is, is Minneapolis and St. Paul are pretty odd downtown areas but if it's so long as it's during the business day you'll probably be all right yeah so it at least worked well for salt lake city totally um and then let's see friday evening so it was kind of they had giant milkshakes i shared a link in the show notes to a twitter moment of the tweets that i posted about it and some tweets that i had retweeted and liked as well um there's also a post by eric uh, bishard from telerik and um, kind of overviewing the conference. I haven't read the whole thing yet, but um, I heard it was a, a good overview. Let's see. What other thoughts do I have? Uh, Michael Chan was an awesome MC. He's the host of the React podcast. I talked with him a little bit after the conference, and he's a super nice guy as well. Yeah, they're all all the talks are on YouTube. I would like to, to kind of compile together a list of ones that I got more out of. Um, I'm, of course, in the kind of analytics space in my professional life, so... I really enjoyed the talks that had to do with D3 um, animations. Uh, there were several that kind of fit that that mark. And then I, I hung out through the towards the end of Sunday. So I got to hang out with people on Saturday. We went on a hike in the mountains a little bit and then hung out during the day and just talked in the hotel lobby, went out, played some board games at a board game place, saw the Salt Lake City Public Library, tried even more food. It was a nonstop weekend. I kind of compared it to the start of college when you just meet lots of people and you're socializing just to meet people and hang out and you're just like nonstop, go, go, go. That is exactly what I did not do when I started college, but yes. <laughs> that was more what I did, but yeah. Right on. What uh, what was the weather like there at, in Salt Lake? Upper 80s to mid 90s and pretty dry. Yeah. So it's good, good a little time. warm. And then I come back to Minnesota and it's nice. It's in the 50s at night and it's kind of cool. It's super comfortable. Yep. So that's React Rally. Totally recommend it next year. And I would love to go back as well. Sweet. Yeah, it's pretty, it seems pretty cool. It seems like a nice, nice one. Um, I, I'm, I'm still hoping that uh, suddenly uh, React Conf opens up another round of tickets and I get one, but we'll see. Yeah, I haven't heard anything. I find it interesting that Dan likes React Rally more than his own React Conf. I'm not sure how much he is involved with organizing it. Well, I'm sure he's know. not, but, yeah. you know. It can be hard to like an event like that uh, when you're in Dan's position, I would imagine. Even if, you're, even if he's not organizing it, I can imagine it would be hard to like an event that your company organizes for a thing that you work for. It's probably mostly a lot of stress for him. Maybe. Well, uh, I heard some rumors today uh, that Apple might be releasing some new devices here in the next couple weeks. Maybe. Yeah, I've, I've heard uh, the speculation is that the next Apple event will be on the 10th Sounds of September, right. uh, which would be a couple of Tuesdays from now. What are we thinking? Well, I'm definitely going to get whatever iPhone comes out because my phone is very old. And I've read a little bit of the rumors, but essentially I'm, I'm very much of the opinion that 
oh my god, I just need to upgrade my phone. <laughs> doesn't really matter what it comes out with. Doesn't matter what they call it. Uh, I'm probably gonna upgrade to whatever they whatever they announce. You have a seven, right? I sure do. Nice. Yeah, it's a little old. Three years, three years, and it still works, but battery's starting to die midday, and you know. It's also a little small. Like I think you need a bigger phone. Nah, uh, it's the perfect size. Like I think you need one that's about six point eight inches. Oh, like the ten S Max. Well, or Max? or like the Note Ten Plus. Ah, I see what you said. <laughs> to be specific. <laughs> yeah. I, I, could I just get an iPad mini with cellular? Would that do it too? Uh, no, because it doesn't have Face ID. Oh, right. Or something. Right. But that is I the see. E&R Buck life from <laughs> five years ago. Well, he probably would still do it if he could. <laughs> he's he's going to get one of the folding phones in a few years. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, new iPhones are probably coming along. Um, do you think they will be good or the same-ish? Or what do you think? I haven't heard much about them, to be honest. I know there have been some rumor things out there. I've been so busy and so focused in like React things, I just haven't read about it too much. So I'm kind of in the dark, ready to be surprised. Though I have heard they're not going to be very different. You know, the that triple camera system or something... Have you but seen think, like the mock-ups of the triple camera system? It is just so obscene. so unappley. Yeah, it's a, it's a big box on the outside of more cameras. Like you can imagine, like I don't know the industrial designer who had to come up with that, and they're like, "Yeah, I haven't seen Johnny here in like eight months. I don't know where he is. I needed to get this design done. I gave it. I put a piece of paper on the table with my kids, and they drew a box with some squiggles inside, and that's what we made. <laughs> yeah. To be fair, that was also Johnny's technique, so, <laughs> you know, she's yeah. just learning from the pros. Yeah, exactly. Well, speaking of pros, uh, do we think it's going to be called the iPhone 11 or iPhone 10 Pro, or what is it? Huh. I, I guess I don't know what it would be what would make it the pro model, right? Like I don't really think of pros as having phones. Like, well, I think I, I, I think I, I don't I don't think of them as separate phones. That's my uh, okay. thing, right? Like why does why does a professional have a different phone? <laughs> so that they can do AR kit testing, obviously. Oh, of course. <laughs> I I don't agree with pro in a phone. I just I mean. It's not a pro. I mean, they're they're nice devices, but there's nothing it's pro about them. I think everyone has a smartphone, and I don't know. It just seems like a weird addition to the line at this point. Some features I would like to see in a pro phone is ability to mute only business calls. Like, nope, you don't get to call me for business. <laughs> so it mutes any contact that has a work so number. Maybe, maybe it's a, like a pro phone has multiple phone numbers on it. Oh, there we go. And, I can do it. And it can do exactly what you just described, and it can intelligently turn those things on and off. Yep. And they already support multiple lines. There you go. But oh. just make that a first-class feature and have bully the carriers into it. Okay, well, phones phones are probably coming. Uh, what about any watch stuff? I haven't heard anything about watch stuff, but... I heard some conjecture on Connected last week or the week before, and they were kind of saying, you know, I don't know if I need a new watch this year. Like, I think they're they're super happy with the Apple Watch Series 4 from last fall, and so maybe they won't update it. I think they will, because they have for the last several years on the year mark. I definitely think it's more of a minor release, Yeah, sure. but we'll see. I heard some talk of a um, new ceramic and maybe titanium watch. So we nice. might get some new hardware in that sense. Uh, personally, I think I will likely buy the Wi-Fi version with aluminum and another sport loop when they are updated this fall. Unless I'm just really not thrilled with it. But I will say, if I have to go another year with my Apple Watch Series 3, the battery at the end of next year will probably be pretty poor. And mm. so, yeah, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I I, uh, I keep – one of the things that I would love to see in an iPhone or an Apple product in general is what Android has had for a long time now, which is an ambient display or an always-on display, which is uh, 
selected pixels on an AMOLED screen can just go off and stay off, but some can be on so that you can see the time or little notification icons. And I think the Apple Watch is one of those devices at this point. Like, it could just do it. So maybe uh, maybe with some, you know, a slight bump in battery capacity, that would be enough to offset having a portion of the display be always on just for a small clock or, you know, something like that. Sure. Yeah. So it seems pretty unlikely that the highly rumored and much desired uh, MacBook Pro 16-inch revision would be appearing here at this event, but, you know, we should still talk about it. Yeah, is this the same time that they were talking about moving to ARM processors, or is that separate? That would be separate. So, you know, the ARM processor thing is kind of weird right now because they also just killed off the MacBook Little Mini Pro. I mean, the little right. MacBook. What did people call that? Uh, MacBook One. MacBook One. Yeah, MacBook One. <laughs> or MacBook Adorable. Yeah, yeah, adorable. Yeah. Uh, so I think I think if any computer was going to have an ARM chip in it, it would have been a MacBook Adorable or MacBook One because that would have made sense. It would have been a simple computer. It would have been just iPad enough like that it would have been just fine and nobody would have even noticed or cared. Probably right about that. But but this this uh, 16-inch MacBook Pro, this is going to be the futuristic and revolutionary new type, like new generation type. Um, new new uh, keyboard switches. Right. Uh, probably a new display um, that goes all the way out to the edges and no longer has, you know, two feet of black bezel. Right. Yeah. That'd I think nice. it'll it'll be a a nice a nice dis- or a nice computer. We'll see about a new keyboard. Maybe maybe not. Um, Do you think it would have Face ID? I hope so. I really hope so. But you never know. You never know. But like my work I computer feel... today or yesterday booted up and touch bar kind of disconnected. So I only can do like the built-in function keys on the touch bar. Oh, like the yeah. thing crashed. So touch ID, face it, or yeah, touch ID doesn't work, and it's getting to be irritating. And I just need to reboot the computer. But things like that still happen. Yeah. So I think face ID would still work through the touch bar because under the hood, it's it's all iOS. Do you think? I, do you think there would be a major revision to the way the touch bar functions? Uh, I think it's probably better to keep it as is. I think like you know, there's still a lot of um, like complaints about the touch bar. Like it's a, a a worse interface than what people had there before. It almost seems like they should just put the function row keys back and just keep the touch bar. Yeah, I think that's they could. I would like the left side escape key to actually be a physical key. Just how t- the touch ID is a physical key. Right, right. But yeah, I don't know. We'll have to see. I kind of like mine. I don't use it a ton, but I will say sliding for volume and brightness is awesome. And yeah, that's cool. I, I it's good. I I did. I do end up just using the the external keyboard to do it all now. So I don't know. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah. Um, I also expect this new MacBook Pro to be like three thousand dollars base model, just because Apple can. Oh yeah, probably. It's gonna yeah. cost a fortune. Yeah. Uh, and then the other question is, what are they going to do with the current generation MacBook Pro models? So, like, they can't get rid of them. They just released a new model in, what, June? Something like so... that. I think they'll do what Apple's done for quite a while, last couple of years, where they keep old models around for, like, three years and then quietly get rid of them. And, I, I mean, I think at least the first generation here is going to be so much of a difference between that and the old ones that it's the cost difference alone is going to be a reason to keep the old ones around. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking too. The other thing that would be funny is if this is the MacBook pro pro. So like the iPhone pro, <laughs> well, why don't you just add another pro to the end of the MacBook pro? And now this right. is what that is. The MacBook pro for true professionals. Exactly. Uh, okay. How about iPads? Are we doing any new iPads this year? I sure hope not. I just bought one of those, but I guess the I guess the iPad Pro is probably about up for renewal. They've been kind of doing it on an eighteen month schedule lately, so I think they're not going to touch iPad till next fall. 
I don't next spring maybe. I don't know what you could do to an iPad that would be relevant at this point. Like, I mean, you can do the spec chip bumps kind of stuff, but like, what else do we want in an iPad right now? I'm pretty happy with my iPad Pro, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I I don't see a reason for them to update the iPad. Uh, they did didn't update this spring for the non pros. I've heard so. a lot of people talking about how the new iPads will have new cameras. Do you, does anybody buy iPads for the camera at this point? Like, there's no way, right? I use my iPad Pro to take a picture at, like, serverless MN. And that's because I'm using my iPad to tweet. Right. And that's the only time I've ever used my camera on that iPad. Speaking of iPads, I was at the State Fair and I was watching people use their phones and stuff. And somebody yeah. was taking a picture and they're like, oh, no, hold on. And then they got out of their bag an iPad and took another picture. And I'm like, no, no, that oh, doesn't no. make sense. Why That's would you absurd. not use your phone? <laughs> I don't understand. Just That's absurd. wild. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I I, I have this 10.5-inch uh, iPad behind me. Uh, it's one of the older pros. And, you know, I never use it except for podcast stuff. But it's it's a cool thing. Apparently, the the new rumor is that they're going to get rid of the 9.7-inch regular iPad and make a new 10.5-inch regular iPad. And I don't understand how many different SKUs of iPad there are at this point. Right. Didn't they do something where the old cases would still work? Like, they kept same, they used the same physical footprint, so there's at least some similarity. Like, the, an old Pro, the old 9.7 Pro became the same size as the new 97 Non pro, maybe something, something like that. I, don't I, remember. I feel like that sounds r- reasonable and logical, but it's just there's just too many, right? It's too hard to keep track. Yeah, four quadrants that's all you get. <laughs> I that's wish, truly indeed. those are simple days. Uh, so we're going to talk about iOS 13.1 here in a second, but um, I heard that there was a desktop operating system. Is that coming out anytime? Yeah, presumably a. About the same time as iOS 13, maybe a little later. Sometimes okay. they delay it. I've heard that's a that's a big issue because there are so many new app permissions and things are sandboxed that it becomes, uh, you know, it was, I think it was early Windows 7 where it would ask, you know, Every do you want to give this application access all the time? I think there's going to be that, but for Mac OS. So, and you know who, bo- eh. who, who that bothered? It didn't bother me. It was fine. Yeah. So we will see. I have not run the betas of any of these things, so I don't really know. That's maybe right. more Brandon's realm. Yeah, I, I am kind of the resident ill-advised beta software user. Um, I did run Mojave on my MacBook Pro until I had to take it in for screen repairs. Um, and I did a little bit of AR kit development on it, and it was it's, I didn't notice anything different. I got Homebrew running just fine. Everything was working just fine. I was concerned with the new permission stuff and some of the new, like, um, what do they call it? Is it gatekeeper? Yep. Is that the, that's the thing that's like that plus system integrity protection or whatever. Yeah. Um, I thought that might cause an issue, but I already have system integrity prote- protection turned off because my system should have no integrity. Um, <laughs> who, who needs it? Who needs it? It can lie to me all at once. Uh, but uh, as a result, um, I think from a, from the perspective of a developer, it should be okay. Um, that said, I, I haven't ran it in a long, long time, uh, because I got that MacBook back maybe two weeks ago now, uh, and I haven't installed Mojave back on it again. So I'm probably going to be sticking it out for as long as I'm using that MacBook for iOS development, particularly time sensitive iOS development. I'm probably not going to upgrade to Mojave for a very long time. It's always a good idea. Uh, when I when I used to have a personal Mac that was worthwhile, I always would wait a year before I upgraded to the next <laughs> one. Yeah, I mean, M- Mojave has been fine. I'm a little worried about uh, the 10.15. I forget what it was called. But oh also, remember Catalina. we dropped Catalina. Catalina. Right. I, I messed it up. I messed it up. So Catalina was what I was talking about when I said Mojave. Okay. Yeah, Goodness I knew gracious. that. Brains. Um, it's fine. Also, it drops 32-bit application support, and Uh-oh. I don't. I need to have. I need to find a tool that like recursively goes through my whole machine looking for things because well, I'm not idea. exactly sure. There's got to be something in there that is old. I'm sure of it. Yeah. So that's a little worrying, but you we'll know what see. I hope? I hope. I hope most of all, I hope all of Jamf is 32-bit. 
My, Brandon, uh, work, Brandon my, gets it. My work computer's VPN is still 32-bit. Oh, too bad it can't work anymore. So sad. Yeah, that's going to be a tricky one. I think they probably push out updates in like every year or two for that kind of stuff and just, you know, manually update things. Perfect. And so they need to get, you know, the next year's updates out so I can keep using it. But we'll see. I will say on the iOS side, I've been running uh, the beta on my iPad for a while because the Pro needs it in order to get uh, ARKit support. And I've actually found it to be pretty darn solid. Um, there are some situations where it'll definitely do a hard crash. But for the most part, it's when I'm doing evil, terrible, multitasking situations that probably just weren't thought out in this early beta that I'm probably still running. Uh, because it's before they set up the provisioning profile method of installing it. Um, so it it definitely seems pretty solid. I know folks have been talking about all sorts of like uh, bugs or hard crashes on it. And admittedly, I'm running early builds, so it's possible that a lot of these crashes were introduced later or reintroduced later. Um, but I, I have had no problem using my iPad on a daily basis. Uh, outside of like using all types of multitasking at once and then launching a third app and then trying to go back to it, that's what seems to make it sad. Um, it's funny because these weird things called desktop operating systems seem to be able to do that just fine. It's weird. They do. Hmm. They do. But turns out when you reapply that paradigm to a par- to a, to an operating system that maybe wasn't designed with that in mind the first go around, things get a little bit more complicated. Yeah, turns out. The most crashy situation I get into usually is when I'm using the iPad, I have Slack open in one pane, I have a web browser in another, and I open up like one password or a terminal emulator in the slide overview. So that's the that's the third kind of multitasking that sits atop the other two windows that are in split view. And that's usually when something starts to get sad and crash, probably because one password is trying to write to some clipboard that is also being you know, some that one or more other apps have a lock on, right? Right. I don't know. I don't know how that works, but that would be my... It's either that or just memory pressure. Could be, but I don't know. There's a lot of memory ostensibly in those iPads. They're supposed to have eight gigs, something like that, That's not, no way. That's not true? No. Let's see, iPad Pro This is This is an Apple product. The one terabyte has more memory than the others, but I don't remember how much either number is. Oh, God. Four gigs of RAM. This thing only has four gigs of RAM. Yeah, what is this, the nineties. Yeah, but you know what? You don't want to know what if you if you invest right now in a Galaxy Note Ten Plus, you uh-huh. can get twelve gigabytes of RAM. <laughs> That's oh, wow. absurd. <laughs> this is but not I... a sponsor ad from Samsung. <laughs> can, can I build an Android app? On a, a Note 10 Plus? Sure. I don't know why you couldn't. You just have to probably build your whole uh, Java SDK <laughs> tool chain yourself. But otherwise, go ahead. Nobody's stopping you. That's true. Nobody's not even Oracle. They. Maybe they should. Maybe not Oracle. <laughs> Maybe Google should. Somebody Maybe should. Google should say, hey, buddy, calm down. <laughs> well, I think without further ado, it might be time to move on to uh, everybody's favorite segment, the pod kit, our new Twitter followees. That's right. Yeah. Um, and for this, I can start. I have I have a really easy one because um, I just want to call out our uh, speakers from JSMN this past week. Uh, we talked about JSMN earlier. Our first, my first Twitter followee uh, is Shalana Faith on Twitter, uh, who is uh, who was our speaker who gave the talk on writing SVGs by hand. It was a super cool demo, as we already discussed, and Shalana is just like kind of one of my favorite people in Minneapolis tech, uh, in, in Minnesota tech in general. Um, so I definitely wanted to make sure to mention uh, Shalana and also Griffin Higley, uh, at Griffin, Griffin Higley on Twitter, who was our Lightning Talk presenter. Griffin's a super awesome person who's come by and helped us set up, helped us tear down at JSM and other events. And it's, it's super cool that he got up there and gave a talk about a uh, feature toggle presentation uh, or about a feature toggle framework that he built for his own uh, apps. So that's super cool stuff. Pretty cool. Um, yeah. 
can you believe I only followed two? Well, I only I only have two people to call out this time. Uh, that's the that's part absurd. I can believe. I believe that you followed two hundred. I followed two hundred. Most of them weren't in tech. Most of them were state fair related. Nice. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Developers but, on a stick. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Uh, uh, undefined is not an object on a stick. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, I think there's somebody uh, after me who's going to more than make up for uh, what I cannot bring to the table in new Twitter followees. Brian, Gulp. tell us about all the awesome folks you met at React Rally and beyond. All right. So I followed, like, I don't really know. I followed maybe 25 people around React Rally time. I also, at one point, sat down and just unfollowed a ton of old stale accounts and things. So my total follower account actually went down. But in reality, the volume of tweets went up pretty dramatically. <laughs> anyway, uh, the first person here is Revel. Uh, he, is, he gave a great talk at React Rally and, as a 10-year-old, uh, had a great uh, like 10x developer shirt on. Uh, I think the title of the talk was, So You Think You're a Junior Developer? But he went through a great example of building a um, a couple of components using hooks. Um, the most uh, like featured, or maybe even the only live coding in the whole conference. It was nice. really a great talk, very well put together. Totally recommend checking it out on YouTube. Very cool. All right. Next up, we have Mihai. He gave a talk also um, using um, things like React Spring and talked about some animations. Um, I think the title of his talk is Off Balance Interactive Storytelling with React. So talking about like interpolating and he gave a demo site where he kind of scrolled through and things were morphing around and circles like overlapping, but having a border in between them and they're kind of morphing and curving the intersection points and things. And he went through some of the math that he used to build those animations. Super cool to learn about. Um, Next up is at Chantastic, who is also known as Michael Chan, or uh, so you can call Michael Chan or Chantastic. Uh, he is the MC, also host of React Podcast, as I mentioned earlier in the episode. He's a super nice guy, has a great podcasting voice, um, does a great job with everything that I've seen him do. Next up is Anjana. She gave a the first talk on Friday. Um, she um, talked about Lambda Calculus with React. So this talk used just arrow functions and was doing things like adding and multiplying numbers. But remember, a number is just a function. So um, writing a couple of helpers that do like two number, two boolean. Um, really interesting talk. Super fun to see crazy functional things. Um, learned a lot from that talk. It's awesome. Next up is uh, Princey Yeah. Uh, she gave a talk about debugging the Firefox debugger. So she went in and um, demoed some features of the debugger, some things I didn't learn about or that I didn't know about that I learned were things like conditional breakpoints. So a breakpoint that'll fire if a certain condition is met in addition to log points. So you can have your application running in Firefox and put in these in these log or breakpoints without having to touch your code at all. So if you really, if you were going to console log, there's no reason to do that even. You can just go to your debugger and add your log points there. And then you can, you know, change things around without having to go back to your code, delete, recompile, etc. Um, she talked about her experience and gave a little demo of changing something in the Firefox developer tools as well. Um, you don't have to recompile Firefox when you change the, dev the dev tools because it's a React and Redux app. Nice. That's pretty cool. And she previewed an upcoming feature that is currently in the nightly builds on Mac OS for Firefox, um, which was time travel debugging. So you can step your application state forward and backwards, and it'll update the UI. It'll, it'll like update everything. It is crazy. So hopefully we'll see more about that in the future. And lastly is um, Elena, uh, known as front end girl on Twitter. Uh, I met her just mingling after one of the talks, um, She's super cool, um, works in the London office with Webflow. That is some of the people I followed on Twitter. Totally recommend checking out my following, uh, yeah, my following list and snooping around and following even more people. Very nice. Yeah, you know, I, I didn't follow as many people as Brian did. 
I followed a few people. Um, I often follow people who follow me, I guess. Uh, and so you know that you know that book the other day that I kept talking about uh, uh, something about engineering management. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I have this on my Kindle. It's called a. Uh, it's like a puzzling. An elegant, laundry. an elegant puzzle. A, an elegant puzzle. There we go. Oh, right. Go. That's the one I bought too. Yeah. So, yeah. like, my 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 job that month was to pawn off this book on as many people as I could, and I think I got at least five people to buy this book. Nice. So, good job. Um, and so I I must have tweeted about this book at some point also, and a bunch of people who read that hashtag or the search terms for that book followed me. And so this guy, um, whose name is terrifying, uh, he works at Uber as the engineering lead, and he's worked at previous places like Skype and J.P. Morgan. And yeah, that's pretty cool. And so I followed him back, I guess. Nice. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What else do I have here? I followed somebody called Amy Simmons. I feel like Brian follows this person also, but I don't know. Oh, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. I, I think I just saw a tweet somewhere and I followed them. She worked on the team that rebuilt the Twitter.com site. Maybe that's why I followed her. Maybe. No way to know. You know, I also never used this website, but wow, it sure does look nice. It does. I have, I'm just clicking on Twitter right now yeah. on the desktop and it's... It's kind of refreshingly Twitter and like clean and pretty responsive and. But it's it's not like a lot of uh, modern web apps these days, which are like this is a good balance between density and open space. I know a lot of people like to hate this new app. I think it's pretty good, at least on a smaller screen. On like a desktop, like full screen, it's kind of absurd. But I think it's actually just fine on even a full screen. I have it right here on a. 27 inch uh 2k panel and it looks great it's just a little big but yes i i think it's it's, it's easy to redesign. see for all of the old people that use twitter now uh yes. so i also follow uh my last twitter following which is uh janessa peterson who followed me at some point for some reason uh she formerly worked at core os and now is working with let's encrypt which is very cool because let's encrypt is very cool janessa is really awesome uh it's possible she knows about you through our conversations on Twitter um, because she and I met through a, uh, a community Slack group. Nice. Uh, yeah, so she's been in town for a little while uh, working for Let's Encrypt, uh, a super cool, super awesome human, and uh, definitely very fortunate to have her in the community uh, because she used to be in San Francisco and uh and uh it's awesome to have people here and not there <laughs> i agree janessa is really great so next next time there's, there's got to be some event that you both will be at and i'm sure i'm sure there will be uh and so she's really cool because she talks a lot about security stuff and i love security stuff i also love hating on um uh anything that has to do with jamf <laughs> I, I think I think uh, I think Ian was entertained by by your uh, Jamf tweets. Uh, <laughs> so this episode Ian was, was also not sponsored by Jamf. It was it was kind of anti-sponsored by Jamf in there some you, ways. There you go. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I know yeah. some cool people who work or have worked at Jamf. They have great people working there. They yeah, sure do. they sure do. That's that's great, but we shouldn't empower bad things. <laughs> so, um, what are we guys? What are, what are you guys doing? Uh, you know, in the next couple of weeks here. Uh, well, I'm about to board a plane tomorrow. Boarding a uh, plane. I'm gonna go do some traveling for for fun this time. No conferences, no work stuff, just a regular old fashioned vacation. So that'll be nice. That is very nice. I hope uh, you're gonna be there for at least a few days and actually get time to relax. Yeah, it should be good stuff. So far, I only have one client call scheduled, so that's that's a new minimum. Uh, I was going to say, uh, don't bring your work computer. That's a new I, minimum. All, all of my computers are now work computers, unfortunately. When you're, when you're self-employed, everything becomes property of the business. Oh, that's uh, true. But uh, I but it should be it should be nice. There there will be 
mountains and hiking and things like that. And so there will be plenty of offline time, which will be nice. But when I come back, uh, I'm going to be working with my uh, fantastic uh, two-way radio stuff that we've been doing for a little while now, um, which is lots of lots of binary packets and lots of networking stuff, which is really cool. I've got to use Wireshark a lot. Some of you might have seen me tweeting about Wireshark. Um, and I, I got to say, it kind of the documentation around a lot of the stuff that I've been working on is um, very frustrating at times, but uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like any sufficiently popular or enterprise product that's not really meant for people to work on or extend really. It's just kind of, they had to document it because they, they basically handed their internal specification documents out to their developers. Right. Um, I feel like Apple docs can sometimes feel this way too. All docs um, can feel that way. Yeah, like IBM is kind of IBM and Oracle are the other two systems where it's like, oh, you didn't actually mean for people to read this. You're just publishing this because it's what you have. Yep. Um, but uh, every it's one of those things where when you spend enough time with it, you start to understand what each of these sentences mean, each of these phrases mean, and each each time you run into it, you, your picture gets a little bit further, um, a, a little bit further kind of fleshed out. So. That's uh, that's been really cool, and I think I'm at a point now where I know how to test what's going on, um, and uh, and that that feels really good because you can use that to build uh, really cool things that nobody else is really doing right now. Because why would they? Because they just they've they've already done their hard work uh, figuring out what they figure out, and now I get to do the fun stuff where it comes to uh, uh, building it slightly differently and for Linux and stuff like that. So that's fun. Anything that has for Linux at the end of it is always a good time. Oh, for Linux, for Mac OS, you name it. The problem is uh, traditionally a lot of this stuff has to be deployed on Windows, which means uh, I'm functionally useless at supporting it. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's been, that's been a challenge, but it's good stuff. How about you, Brian? I will be on call for the first time ever at my work. Oh, fancy. To support uh, an older legacy database data movement system. I'm basically online to to take in things, walk through a checklist of try this if this is happening, and then I call a database engineer. So, uh, data engineer. when you're on call, do you just get a text message or like do you get a pager? Uh, I think some texts and then some calls depending on the priority and if I'm primary or secondary on call. So I'll be secondary for a week, and then I'll be primary for a week. So I'll nice. have to start lugging around my MacBook, and I should probably test that like I can do stuff still. I haven't opened up anything that does SQL since May when this thing first started. So, yeah, yeah, we'll see. I'm I'm paranoid about it, but yeah, no. So it's it's totally okay. My mom uh, works in healthcare, and so she has to be on call once a month or so for like a weekend because uh, the team rotates and. She was so paranoid about missing one of the on-call text messages that I wrote her a little Android app that would intercept those messages and then read them out loud to her and beep, buzz, and vibrate for like minutes on end until she accepted (laughs) it on the phone. And she really loves it. And she's been on call while she's been at work, and people hear her phone going crazy, and they also love it. Uh, But they don't have Android phones, and so that's That's what they lose out on. Um, so if you feel like you are missing all your calls, Brian, feel free to uh, invest in a Galaxy Note 10 Plus. <laughs> our our on-call phones are all iPhones, and I think they've kind of tasked me with updating them. Okay, as well, I, that, as I that's get fair. Them, but, uh, I, had um, to, I had to slip that non-ad promo in there one last time. Sorry, so Brian, did you imply that you, you get a special on-call phone when you're on-call? Yeah, so it's a phone that... It has uh, the same number, and so all of the alerts go to those set numbers all the time, and whoever's on call hands the phones over. That is ridiculous, but also not a bad idea. Nope, still ridiculous. It's a good separation of uh, work and personal thing, and that's something I fought a little bit for because I like to have my phone on Do Not Disturb at night when I'm sleeping, so I'm not woken up in the middle of the night by Uh, random things. That's why I have this custom app. (laughs) But the thing is... Who knows where it's coming from? Like someone else at the company might be calling you as on call, 
like from a from a some random number in the company or their own personal device. So right, you can't right. really guarantee that it's going to be a certain number of numbers actually calling you. Yeah. So do you know what system is backing all of that? Like, is it pager uh, duty? I have no idea. It's yeah. probably. I wouldn't be surprised if it's no. The text alerts are uh, email. You know, phone number at. Uh, att.net or something yeah. Verizon yeah. or whatever yeah yep. mm-hmm. I don't know what the phone calls are um, I've never been on the receiving end of one of them okay I guess you're gonna find out I certainly will <laughs> there haven't been any problems for the last month or so so I'm hopeful that it'll be okay but I've never seen my coworkers look so paranoid and stressed when that phone rings and then it's just a telemarketer <laughs> oh that's <laughs> yeah I, I I hope they like log a ticket for like uh and copy verbatim like this is the social security office <laughs> right the conspicuously fake like telemarketing lately you know, it's been it's been like calls in Mandarin and you have no idea what they're saying and so you just say hello and okay and hang up. Oh but, geez. that's yeah. incredible. Uh, what let's about you, see. Ryan? Yeah, uh, I am traveling for work next week. I am going back to the uh, w- lovely state of Illinois and going down to uh, Urbana-Champaign again to do some intern stuff. Nice. So so the, the program down there is sort of this revolving door kind of thing. So in the summer, you get 40 hours of work time for you know whatever, how many ever people sign up. And then during the school year, fall and spring, you get uh, you know some part-time opportunities so you know 15 to 20 hours you know whatever works for you and obviously that can be flexible through the semester and it's really cool so you get to actually work on a project during the summer you get to work on a different project during the fall and a different project during the spring and the projects are roughly calibrated so that you know you can actually work with a team of people uh semi-remote even though you're all on campus because you know you've got class and other stuff to do so that's pretty cool. That's awesome. So we're going to I'm going down there with some other uh people from work and uh we're we're gonna get the next group set up. Uh I don't know if I'm supposed to call these these groups of students in the internship program like classes or cohorts or seasons, but we need a name for them because it's becoming a problem. <laughs> I get you. And we're not going to call them Team Mordor or Team Vikings or whatever crazy nonsense. We're gonna use numbers like a sane human being. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that'll be fun. Yeah. Uh, let's see what else do I have to do. Um, yeah, like Brandon, I'm also on like five projects, and so I'm doing all of those at once. So it's you know it's a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of a lot of things are going well these days. It's good. Nice. And then, of course, here on the Nexus, I believe there's a Nexus special coming up for a very exciting Apple event. Super cool. We'll talk about all the phones that we're going to buy. Yeah, uh, or not buy. You never or know. Or not buy. The one, the one watch and the one phone that might be purchased. Right. Okay, well, uh, you know what time it is now. It is time to find out where we can find you on the internet, Brian. You can find me just about everywhere, but especially on Twitter at Brian Mitch L or my website, brianm.me, where... Hopefully someday the next like month or two I'll have a UI for my secret Santa slash gift exchange utility. Nice. How about you, Brandon? You can find me all sorts of places, but in particular on Twitter where I'm Brandon underscore MN or on my website, Brandon.mn, which currently just has a paragraph that's somewhat out of date that says that I I, I am a freelance software developer. That's cool. Sounds right. How about, how about you, Ryan? Well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on Twitter at Ryan Amar. And of course, on my website, RyanRepresent.com, and sometimes at the State Fair of Minnesota. Ooh, so cool. Gotta get those mini donuts. Yep, I, I did, and I brought some home for the dog, and the dog loved them. Perfect. <laughs> what is it with dogs and cinnamon? Dogs really love cinnamon, I feel like. I, I don't know, but uh, she liked them a lot. It's probably just the, the like, two ounces sugar? of sugar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. More sugar than dough. To e- exactly. Beef. Well, you can uh, find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash pk51. You can also have some discussion about it on our subreddit, which is reddit.com slash r slash thenexustv. Or on Twitter, of course. You can tweet at us. Um, uh, in addition, if you like what we're doing over here at The Nexus, you can... Um, 
give us a tip at patreon.com slash the nexus tv okay until next time it's been a good one have a good one have a good one The Nexus. The Nexus. The Nexus TV. Podcasts from, from the, the Technological, technological Convergence. convergence.